We're turning to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, commencing to read at verse number one. <clears throat> Acts chapter 13, verse number one, continuing our series in the church. And we come to a new topic today in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also joined to their minister. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, was stood then, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety, and all mischief, thy child of the devil, thy enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist, a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Amen. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless us. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the reading of thy word. We praise thee, O Lord, for what our ears have heard already today. We thank thee, Lord, that this is a revelation of the Lord ruling over his church, leading his church, advancing his church. And we pray, O oh God, that we will learn practical and spiritual lessons that will help us in the work of God here in Buckerfeld. Lord, we long to be the church that Christ desires us to be. We long, Lord, to cease from things that do not bring honor to thee. And we long to go through with God. We know this is a pathway of blessing. And therefore, we pray today you'll speak to our hearts. Speak to us, Lord. It's a collective body. We pray, Lord, that <coughs> for our eldership, Lord, as we make decisions, Lord, that will be decisions from heaven and approved of God that will be right for this church and take us forward. We pray you'll save us from our own selves and from our own thoughts and things that would hinder the work of God here. But we do pray for the individual members of the church that you'll speak to them as well. And Lord, we need as individuals to have a right standing before God and to be walking faithfully. Lord, we pray you'll bless the members of this congregation. Oh Lord, if there are any not saved this morning, you'll speak to their heart, Lord, and show them their need to be a part of this work, the part of Jesus Christ through faith in his finished work. We pray, O oh God, that you will bless in the word that is preached. I pray, Lord, you'll empty me of self and sin. Fill me with thy spirit. May God be glorified in the words that I say. Lord, let anything fall to the ground that is not of thee. We ask these things, claiming the power of God in Jesus' precious name. Amen <clears throat> and amen. We want to continue our study in the church. We thought about the promise to the church, I will build my church. We thought uh, about the problems in the church, how to deal with them. We thought about the preaching in the church, the purity in the church, the privileges of the church persecution against the church and then the prayers of the church last time there in Acts chapter 12. We're now coming to Acts chapter 13 and we're thinking about the people in the church, the people in the church. 
I know whenever we maybe said this morning we're coming to church, we thought in our head about the building. Uh, the building that we're coming to we call our church building. But the reality is the church is not the buildings. The buildings belong to the church, and the church is made up of individuals. And therefore, there are various peoples that are uh, introduced here in chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, and we want to look at the people in the church. Who are these people? What are their characteristics? What ought to mark them? Well, the first thing I want you to notice about the people in the church is that they are a people who have been saved. Now, that's from the context of verse number 13. It says, now there were in the church. What does the word church mean? Well, it comes from a word which means to be called out. And it's a people who are called out, and obviously that is a calling out from sin's nature and darkness onto fellowship and unity with the Lord. It also was a thought of the word assembly, assembling together. And therefore, the church of Jesus Christ are to be a people who are assembling together on a regular basis. It makes absolutely no sense to be saved and not to be assembling with the people of God. The very word teaches us that we are to assemble together. And I read Psalm 89 this morning in our reading, and it says in Psalm 89, verse 7, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. And therefore, this church, this assembly, this people who are called out of sin and into Christ are to be a people who have reverence for the Lord, to respect the Lord, to fear the Lord, to honor the Lord. And that ought to be seen even in our conduct of coming into the house of God. People ought to know the way we approach God's house and walk into God's house and sit down at God's house that we are in the church of Jesus Christ because there's fear and reverence of God. We're coming into God's presence. That's first and foremost in our mind. It's not about talking to people. It's not about seeing who's here. It's about coming into the presence of God. And whenever we think of the Lord's definition of the church and how he speaks about the church, then we're very sure that the church, as referred to in Scripture, is a people who are saved by the grace of God and washed in the blood of the Lamb. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 just to show you how the Lord speaks about the church and how we can see that this is a people who are saved. Ephesians chapter 5, and it says there in verse number 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The word gave means to surrender or to yield up. And he surrendered himself to death upon the cross. He yielded up himself and he gave himself over to those who would crucify him. He gave himself over to the wrath of his father and the punishment that we deserved. Why? Because he loved us. Then we see in verse number 24 of that chapter, therefore, as the church is subject, or as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And the second thing we notice here, when the Lord is speaking about the church, is the people who are subject to him. Now, we know by our nature that we're born with, our sinful nature, that we're not subject to the Lord. We're not subject to the laws of God and the desires of God. We're not subject to please God, not at all. In fact, we're rebellious to the Lord and we're enemies of the Lord. To be subject to the Lord is only possible when you're saved. And therefore, the Lord is saying here that as the church is subject unto Christ, because they've been saved and the nature has been dealt with within and new desires have been placed within, they delight to be subject unto their Lord. And then, of course, we see verse 27, the desire of Christ for the church, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And there's the Lord's desire for the church. He might present it to himself a glorious church. And therefore, it has to be a saved church, purged from sin and saved by grace. And therefore, when we speak about the church in Scripture, we are speaking about a people who have been saved. Do you see the night or the morning or the day that you said, Lord Jesus, save me. Take away my sin. Be my Savior. Be my King. Be my Lord. You became a part of the universal church of Jesus Christ. You became a member of that people who are called the church in Scripture. And that was only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repentance from sin. My question to you this morning is, you're in God's house. You are at church. 
but are you in the church? Are you a part of the church of Jesus Christ? I'm not asking you to remember a Mockerfeld Free Presbyterian Church. That doesn't matter. I'm asking, are you in Christ? Are you in his church? Have you been saved by grace and washed in the blood? The first thing we notice here in Acts chapter 13 is that the church is a people who have been saved. But secondly, when we think about the people in the church, we see that they are a people under authority. And you look there in verse number one, and we see that at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. And then we also see, as they ministered to the Lord, in verse two, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, the Holy Ghost spoke to them. So we have prophets here, we have teachers here, the Holy Spirit is speaking through them and to them. And we find that this is a group of people who were in under authority within the church. Now, we know through reading through the New Testament that there were apostles, there were prophets, there were teachers, there were evangelists, there were missionaries in the New Testament. Uh, we find that as we see these different offices, the Lord gives us instruction in who could hold these offices and how to fulfill these offices. In the church today, we have uh, individual assemblies of believers, and they meet together at what we call the local church. And this is what is being described here at Antioch, the church at Antioch. This is a local New Testament church. We in Mockerfeld are a local New Testament church. And there is authority within the church. It's just not a gathering of people deciding what to do, but it is a people who are under authority. Today at our churches, we have elders. And that's those men who are saved, walking with the Lord, who have been selected by the congregation to be in spiritual leadership over them. Their main duty is to care for the spiritual needs of the congregation and the spiritual needs of the church, the members, to lead forward in a spiritual manner, to make decisions that will bless this church spiritually. In fact, whenever we read the Word of God, their primary ministry and their primary focus is to be prayer, a ministry of the Word. Prayer, a ministry of the word. We find that in Acts chapter 6. And our elders' chief duty for this congregation is to pray for it, to live well before it, and to feed the flock of God. Now, in the church, there is a teaching elder, and I am the teaching elder of this congregation. And in our other churches, there are teaching elders. Now, that doesn't set me apart from the older elders. We're all equal. We have all the same authority. One is not more important than the other. I have a different office. I have a different role in terms of I have a teaching ministry in this congregation. But our elders are in rulership of this congregation and they are in authority. Now, we are also under authority. We're under authority of our brethren in the presbytery. And the presbytery is also under authority and they're under the authority of the Lord. And it's a very solemn responsibility to be an elder for we will give an account of how we have exercised and fulfilled that office and that role. And I tell you, that really is very solemn. And we ought to pray for the elders of this congregation. They need the prayers of God's people. You need to pray for them that they will be spiritual men who make spiritual decisions and lead in a spiritual manner. And we need the prayers and covet the prayers of God's people. Then also in the congregation we have committee men or deacons. And theirs is not the spiritual rulership, but theirs is rather the practical oversight of the physical and practical needs of the congregation. And that includes, for example, the buildings and the finances and even the practical needs of people within the congregation. And we work together. We're under authority. There's no one person in charge, but rather it is working together under the authority of the word of God. But the very fact that the people of the church are a people under authority, when we read about the selection of those who will rule in the church, we realize that the church members are identified in the New Testament. You see, there is to be membership of a local congregation. This is a biblical principle. You say, well, where do you get in the Bible that we are to be a membership of a local congregation? Well, turn with me to Acts chapter 6. There are many passages we could turn up, and we will in future days be turning them up to show the importance of membership in a local congregation, but this is one of the most important ones. The work of God has increased greatly, and there is so much work to be done that there's not enough people to do the work. And there needs to be more people 
added on to the leadership of the congregation. <clears throat> in this instance, it is those who are going to be deacons or those who are going to be committee men. And therefore, here's what is said. Verse number three. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we, that is the elders of the oversight, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now it says here, look ye out from among you. From among whom? From the church. To those who are members of this church. Like the churches today, there were people coming to these gatherings just out of interest. People maybe not saved within the, within the meetings. People coming to hear the gospel. So not every single person who sat within the building or sat within the gathering was a member of the church. It's speaking about those who are committed to the work of God, who were identified as a church in this area. In other words, those who are membership of this congregation. They weren't to go looking outside. It says, look ye out among you. Look within, look at your congregation, look at your membership, look at those who belong to your congregation and see who is suitable for these rules. They were identified by their membership of the congregation. Then the qualifications, it says, men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And I want you to notice, and this is important if you we ever come to a time when we are electing people for office in this congregation. It is not those who potentially to fulfill this criteria. But it's men that have these marks right now. They're honest now. They're full of the Holy Ghost now. There's wisdom now. Not that they might be good and you know if they got a bit of time under their belt, they would be honest, good men. No. It's men who stand out spiritually now. And therefore, brethren and sisters in this congregation, those who remember this congregation, we are to be like this now. This is not just the responsibility of the deacons and of the elders of a congregation. This is the responsibility of every member. The people were to even look in and see people who were full of the Holy Ghost, people who were honest, people who had wisdom. And we ought to strive for these things, whether we're office or whether we're not in office. And this membership shows that there are people who are willing to commit to a work. It shows there are people who are humble enough and teachable enough to be under authority who are led by God's word, who are obedient to God's truth. And I would say to you, if you're saved by the grace of God, it ought to be that you join a local New Testament congregation and come into membership of it. Some people don't want to come into membership of congregation because you think, well, I'm not putting myself under the authority of so-and-so or so-and-so. Friend, you missed the point. You missed the point. Putting yourself in membership of a local congregation is a public identification that you're committing to this work. It's saying, I put my back to the work and I'm going to support it and I'm going to be faithful. But it's also saying, I want to be a part of the work and I want to be blessed in the work and I want to be cared for in the work. And it's also saying that I am putting myself under authority, recognizing that the authority is not just the men who are in, a, in eldership, it's under the Lord. It's under the Lord. And I would encourage you to pray about that. If you are not a membership of a congregation, pray about where the Lord would have you to be and if the Lord would have you to be in membership. All are under the Lord. Paul said in Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church. I friend, no one has a greater say than the Lord. No elder no committee man, no minister. doesn't matter who they are, what qualifications, how the Lord has used them in the past. The Lord is the final say. His word is the final authority. We do not do anything outside of the word of God. And therefore, the Lord is the leader of the work. So it's the people who have been saved. It's the people under authority. But second, thirdly, it's the people with a vision. Look at verse number three. And when they had fasted, of Acts 13, when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and they sent them away. And here we see a people with a vision. And the vision was to see the church grow and expand and mature and develop. You see, they preach to those in their locality. We know that because it says at the end of chapter 12, verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied. 
The work was growing because the word of God was being preached and the work multiplied. We know, if you turn actually back to Acts chapter 11 and verse number 26, it says, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So we know that the Christians were preaching to those in their locality because of the growth of the church and because of the testimony of the church. People called them Christians. Literally, many Christs, a version of Christ. They were doing things that Christ did. They took the name of Christ upon them. It was probably an insult at the start. But they preached to those in their locality. But we also see from Acts chapter 13 that they supported the work of foreign mission. And we find that in the church... Saul, or that is, of course, Paul, and Barnabas were to be separated for the work of God. And this church prayed, and they fasted, and they laid hands on them, and they sent them away. And the thought here is this, that they were sent. They sent the men, and they sent the finances to support these men. We know from the New Testament that the church and the home church kept in touch, and the missionaries kept in church with touch with the home church to let them know what was going on, what to pray for, what needs they had. We know that the church prayed for their missionaries. They're doing it right now. They're fasting, they're praying, they're laying their hands on them. And they didn't send just anyone. But they sent God's choice. God chose who would go. There may be many men capable of going. But there were men who were chosen and called by the Lord. And I want you to notice the vision for outreach into the community and the vision for outreach into the foreign mission came from the Spirit of God. You see, it says here, the Lord, or the, as he ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. And I'm going to tell you this. The only way you'll have a vision to reach your family and your friends and your community, and have a burden to see the work of God prosper in all their parts of this world is when the Holy Ghost puts it within your heart. When will that happen? That will happen when you're in the Word of God. And you see the power of the Word. And you see how the Word is preached, and how it prospers, and how it is the way to see souls saved. And when that is done, you'll have a burden. I want to do that. I want to go. You'll catch the vision. Man and woman, we need to be reading the word of God. We need to be reading there in the book of Acts. We need to be reading the epistles, what the Lord does through his word. And then we need to say, I want this in my day. I want this in my town. I want this in my family. It's good to read biographies of godly men and women who were missionaries and they went out at the call of God to see what God has done. Those are not stories that used to be. That's what the Lord can do now. And this church had a vision. They reached outside They're gathering to those in the community to the degree that they were marked and called Christians, but they also sent from within their ranks those to the farthest ends of the world, the known world at that time. And it's good to have a vision. I pray we need to pray that God will burden us with a vision for this community. We thank God for those whom he has called out of this congregation For those who are now in all their parts of the world ministering his precious word. But like this church in scripture, we need to pray for them. We need to support them. We need to keep in touch with them. This is a people with a vision. But we notice in this church, not only are they people who've been saved, a people under authority, a people with a vision, but they are a people in unity. Look what it says in verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord, they fasted. Verse number 3. And when they had fasted and prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. We see a unity here. The church is working as one. There's not a pulling this way and a pulling that way. There's not stand, somebody standing with a big head on them, huffy face, saying, oh, I don't think that's right. Everybody's working together. Everybody is working together. You see, in this church, there were people of different backgrounds. That's very clear. We see that... Uh, Given there in verse number one, there's Barnabas, Simeon, uh, Lucius. uh, There's someone brought up with Herod, someone who was brought up basically in the royal palaces. Barnabas who came from uh, another country and different ones were there. And there were different backgrounds, social backgrounds, personalities, temperaments, abilities. But you know what? They're all working together. There's a oneness. There's a unity. There's a completeness. Why? Because they were under God's authority. And they were under God's word. They were obedient to what the Lord said. You see, the Holy Ghost spoke to them and they moved. 
They did what God called them to do. Do you know why there's divisions in churches? Do you know why there's problems in churches? Do you know why there's disunity in churches? Because some people are doing what God wants them to do and some people are not doing what God wants them to do. Some people are obedient and some people are disobedient. If everybody is obedient to the word of God and everybody is going through with God, there will not be any disunity. Sin brings disunity. Disobedience brings disunity. Backsliding brings disunity in the church. People who are not obedient to God cause divisions in churches. And that's the reality. And therefore, this church was a church in unity. If you are a Christian in this church, then you need to pray that God would bless you and your brothers and sisters with unity. Word of God says, where the brethren dwell together in unity, there the Lord commandeth the blessing. That's not my words, friends, the word of God. Don't you think you can come in to God's house as a Christian with hatred in your heart, with bitterness in your heart, with a sinful attitude against a brother or sister in your heart and expect the blessing of God is impossible. God's blessing falls when the brethren dwell together in unity. Are you part of the work of God? We need to pray that we are right with God because there'll be no unity if we're not right with God. Believer, are you walking with God today? Is there some sin that God says you need to get dealt with because you are not being blessed and you'll not be part of the blessing? Get it right with God and then get right with each other. Get right with each other. I know not everybody by their personality will be best friends or be very close, maybe even socially. But I tell you this, there is to be nobody in the work of God that we have a bitterness toward in our heart or hatred towards. And if we do, we need to pray. Pray for the person and pray for your heart. F.P. Meyer once said, Holy Spirit, make me merciful in the judgment of others. May I think no evil. Deliver me from the spirit of retaliation. Help me to speak and think of others as I would have them do of me. Make me pure in heart, not only in my outward walk, but in my deepest thoughts. And that's a great prayer. He's praying that he be the genuine article. The genuine article. A people in unity. And I tell you, our unity will only come under the word of God. Our unity will only come when we say the only reason I'm here is for the glory of God. I'm not here that people praise me. I'm not here that people think good of me. I'm not here to get the pat on the back. I'm not here to be the center of attention. No. I'm here for the glory of God. And that keeps us humble. And that's our desire. Do you know there is going to be Attacks against the church as we know that. But we need the Lord to come. We need the Lord to bless us. And we need unity. A friend, unity will be found when God's people are praying together. And they're worshipping together. And they're serving together. Fifthly, we are not only a people who have been saved, a people under authority, a people with a vision, <clears throat> a people in unity. But we are a people not yet glorified. It says there in verse number one, there were certain prophets and teachers. It gives the names. And then it speaks about Barnabas and Saul in verse number two. What does that mean? It's speaking about men. And obviously throughout scripture, men and women who make up the church of Jesus Christ. They are saved sinners. Born again of the spirit of God. But they are men. And they are women. And they are not yet glorified. They have not yet been made like Christ as we will be on the day when we see him as he is. When we see the Lord, we shall be like him. But that hasn't happened yet. Yes, we're saved. And yes, we're justified. And yes, the work of sanctification is taking effect within our lives. But friend, we're not perfect and we're not sinless just yet. Thank God for the day whenever we're free from temptation and free from sin. It will not be possible for us to sin. And I want to show you something here about this church. These were not perfect people. Paul and Barnabas, they had a fallout. They had a fallout. They disagreed 
upon John Mark. And you know, they had a fallout, but they didn't let it wreck the church. They disagreed with each other, but they put the work of God ahead. And they went on with. Now, they did separate from each other for a while. But you know, there was a reconciliation. Through grace, they came back together again and they worked together again. Not only that, I want to say this, these men, even these men who were called, these men called of the Holy Ghost, Barnabas and Paul, they were not always right in their thinking. There were times they wanted to go into one country or one city or one part of a region and they made to go into the city and the next thing we read in Scripture, but the Holy Spirit prevented us. Or the Lord prevented us. In other words, the Lord said, no, that's not where I want you to go. I want you to go this direction. You see, they didn't always have the right thoughts. And not only that, they needed to continually seek for God's grace and God's wisdom. They needed to continually pray that God would help them and that God would strengthen them and that God would bless them. And I want you to remember something here. Dear child of God, Dear man and woman in this congregation who's been saved by the grace of God, you are not perfect. That may come as a surprise to you, but you are not perfect. I am not perfect. The people who make up the church of Jesus Christ are not perfect. And you're going to fail, and I'm going to fail. And you're going to sin, and I'm going to sin. And we need to be very careful that we don't set ourselves up as some person who looks down on others and has these standards for other people that we cannot keep for ourselves. And I have seen it before in the work of the Lord. And people get these ideas and these standards and say, well, I think this is right, and they live this certain way, and they have this rule for their life. And you know what? It's an impossible rule to live by. And they told so many people, this is the way a Christian ought to live, and this is what a Christian ought to do. And when it came down to it, they weren't able to do it themselves. And what I'm saying to you is this. Remember when you come into this body of believers, we are human beings. We will make mistakes. At times, sadly, we will hurt or offend each other. At times, we'll do things that are wrong and downright stupid. But we need to remember that we are the church of Jesus Christ. And when we do something like that, we need to have grace to turn around and say, look, I'm sorry. And we need a wisdom to say, Lord, forgive me for what I have done. And if I hurt someone, Lord, give me the grace to go to them and say, We need to realize that the work of the church is not for everybody in the congregation to come and make big of me and do right by me. And if they offend me, boy, will they know about it. Folks, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's carnality. That's pride. That's sin. That's how Lucifer fell from heaven. He raised himself up thinking he was better than all. Don't let that be in your heart. Don't let that be in the church. We're a people not yet glorified. We're going to make mistakes. And I trust we'll have patience with others whenever they fall, whenever they make mistakes, and we'll turn around and we'll try and help them up. And I trust others will have grace and patience with us and with me when I make mistakes and when I fall and when I fail, and we'll help each other up. Not trying to get the news of the downfall out as quickly as possible. Not trying to blacken or hurt others. Friend, that's not the work of God. That's sin. Those are the actions of hell. And therefore, we as God's people need to remember we're a people not yet glorified. Don't look for perfection in others. Don't expect it in others. And don't expect it in yourself. That we strive to be like Christ. We strive for the prize. We try to do what we can to live for the Lord. But let's remember we are human. And let's remember there will be times we make mistakes. But remember in the church of Jesus Christ there ought to be grace and patience. And a godliness and a building up of the dear believer. Not a kicking them. Not a, (laughs) didn't expect anything more than that. Final thing is this. 
a people who have been saved, a people who are under authority, a people with a vision, a people in unity, a people not yet glorified, but then, praise God, they're a people depending on God's promises. Why is there a church in Antioch? Why is there sending forth? Why was there an outpouring of the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost? We have to go back and ask the question, why, why, why? What's the basis of this? What's the origin of this? Why did this happen? It happened because before the Lord Jesus Christ left this earth, he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And just before he said that, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This was the work of the Great Commission. This was the result of the Lord's message to go and teach all, all in your community and all in the world. Now, everybody is called to go, but everybody is called to be working and doing something in the work of God and in the Great Commission. And that's exactly what was happening here. And if you look at Acts chapter 13, verse 5, it says, And when they were at Sal- Salamis, They preached the word of God in the synagogue. They were doing what the Lord called them to do. They went and they preached the word of God. They taught the word of God. And today, we are a part of the Great Commission. We are a result of the people coming whole down the generations who were faithful to the word of God. And today, we've heard the truth and we believe. You see, God had promised them power for service. All power is given unto me. Maybe there's someone here and you're entering in 2018 and you're in a work And you feel, I can't do it anymore. I'm tired, I'm discouraged, I maybe haven't seen much happening. I don't know if I want to or can do it anymore. Can I say to you that the word of God tells me that all power is given unto Christ. And if God has called you to do a work, he will give you the power to do it. And maybe we need to stop trying to do it on our own strength and ask the Lord to help us rely on him. Not only that, God has promised success in service. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So therefore, as they're taught, they're going to be saved and then they're going to be baptized and then teaching them to observe all things. They're going to be ministered to and discipled. You see, when the Lord calls us to do something, there's going to be success. When we preach the gospel, it's going to prosper. Now, we might not see it. We might not see it but it will prosper. I will understand someday in heaven that how the, how the preaching of the gospel, whenever we thought it didn't make any difference or any impact, how it did prosper and how the Lord used it. In other words, the people were to go out and preach and look for the increase and expect the blessing. They had to believe it would come. And friend, we need to come to God's house believing the blessing's coming. We need to come believing that through the preaching of his word, God's going to bless me today. God's going to save souls. God's going to change lives. And not only that, God had promised his presence and service. Lo, I am with you always, even on to the end of the world. He says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, whether it's a prayer meeting, whether it's a gospel meeting, whether it's a one-on-one, whatever it is you're doing for the Lord, he is with you. And therefore, this is a church with a people depending on God's promises. How do I know that? Because he sent the men out to do the work. Friend, it's humanly speaking, and you know what I mean when I say this. Humanly speaking, to those who are dead in sin, have no love for the Lord, and no desire for Christ, it seems ridiculous to go and tell them to turn from their sin and trust Christ. Doesn't it? Ah, but the Lord's with them. And it's in the Lord's power, it's the Lord's strength, and he's going to change them. And he's going to do the miracle. And he is going to transform the life. And we have every faith that the gospel is the power of God on salvation to everyone that believeth. See, we are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the church. And I ask you today, are you a part of the work of God and a blessing in the work of God? Are you walking with God? Do you realize who you are in Christ? Are you someone who just comes to church? Doesn't really care. Come to church, I've done my bit. Leave it for the rest of the week. 
One of the best hymns that is ever written about the church was the hymn, The Church's One Foundation. It was written by a man called Samuel John Stone. And he was <clears throat> uh, speaking out in Africa in the 1800s. And during that time, there was a man who was out there and there was a division in the church of South Africa. And the man who caused the division was teaching that parts of the word of God were fictitious or allegories. In other words, they were just stories to prove a point, but they weren't real. For example, Joshua. Those men marching around the city and the city falling down. Well, of course, that couldn't happen. That's only to teach us principles. And this man got very, very annoyed and very, very uh, discouraged by what was happening. And there was a great division within the church at that time. And he sat down and he wrote the hymn, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and brought her to be his holy bride. And with his blood he bought her. And for her life he died. And then he wrote this verse. And this verse isn't actually in our hymn book. He said, The church shall never perish her dear Lord to defend, to guide, to sustain and cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those who hate her and false sons in her peal against the foe or traitor, she ever shall prevail. Praise God, the church shall never perish. And there are men and women here today and you think of everything. You've got everything the world has to offer and you think, well, I'm the big man, I'm the big woman. I've got all I need to make me happy. I'm happy, I'm secure. But friend, if you're not in the church of Jesus Christ, there's coming a day when you will be separated from those who are. Would you be cast into hell for all eternity? Imagine sitting in God's house, sitting among the very people of God, you cast out into hell. No saviour, no hope, no rescue. I trust and pray today you'll come to Christ and be part of this church. We're turning to hymn 615. We're just going to sing three verses. That is the church's one foundation. <coughs> We're going to sing verse 2, verse 4, and verse 5. Verse 2, verse 4, and verse number 5. Standing to worship the Lord and then remaining standing for prayer.
Our Father, we thank thee and we do praise thee that we have been learning today about the people who make up thy church. We thank thee, Lord, we are saved people. We thank you, Lord, we are not members of the church of Jesus Christ by baptism, and we're not members through communion. We're not members by good works or any other means, but we're members through the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, we're saved by grace, washed in blood, and filled with the Spirit of God. We praise thee, Lord, that we are thine and thine alone. Thou hast said, thou wilt never leave us, and you will never forsake us. And yet we realize that the church can either glorify God or dishonor him. And we pray, O Lord, that we will be a pure and spotless bride. We pray, O God, that you will help us to be faithful, help us to be holy. O Lord, help us to be a people of unity. There the Lord commandeth the blessing. Lord, we pray for the blessing of God, but we pray, first of all, for the unity of the people of God. Lord, take away pride and selfishness in their hearts. Take away anything, Lord, that would hinder the blessing of God. Lord, take us, Lord, from, Lord, those hearts that think so much of ourselves to be hearts that fall down before the Lord and say, for thy glory and for thine honor alone. Lord, help us, we pray, to live well for our Savior. Give us a vision, Lord, for this community, for families. Oh, Lord, give us a vision, Lord, even for the foreign field, to be in prayer for it, to support it, to encourage those who've gone from this congregation, Lord, to different churches in this province and across the world. We thank you, Lord, for those you have raised. And we pray yet, Lord, for this church at home that you will continue to bless it, you continue to prosper it. Lord, we need thy power. We do not long to entertain people into the seats. We long to preach the power of God, in the power of God, and the message of the gospel, that people be saved and transformed and will delight to come to worship thee. Oh, Lord, give us hearts that long for more of God. Give us hearts, Lord, that long for thy presence in every meeting. Oh, Father God, I pray that you'll set our people praying in this new year. I pray, Father God, that you will help us to see the power of God come down, our community changed, our people matured, and, O oh God, going on with thee. Lord, we need thee. This cannot be done in the power of man. This cannot be done in the whim of a preacher. Lord, this must be done through the Spirit of God. We pray, Lord, you'll take our church and you'll bless it. Until the day you call us home, keep us faithful, keep us advancing, keep us prospering in the things of God. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.